And now let's talk about money, the geopolitics of money. Every day we tell you about global trends, about economies under pressure, currencies going up and down. Today we want to discuss how the world economy functions. You see, every country has its own currency, but every country does not use its own currency to interact with the world. So which currency do they use? Mostly the US dollar. The dollar is the currency behemoth of the world. No currency comes close to it. We're talking in terms of usage, oil trade, goods trade, generally most of the world trade is settled using the US dollar. Most international transactions between countries and companies are conducted using the dollar. The dollar is also the world's dominant reserve currency. What does that mean? A significant chunk of wealth owned by countries around the world is held in dollars. It's their reserve currency. They save their money in dollars. Global financial systems will collapse without the US dollar. So will the world economy. So the dollar and the US have a lot on their shoulders. And that's not necessarily a good thing. As of 2020, the US had close to $2 trillion in circulation. $2 trillion. And guess what? Half of that is believed to have been in circulation outside America. What about the markets? Around 90% of forex trading involves the US dollar. Forex, of course, is foreign exchange. 90% of this is done in the US dollar. Almost 40% of the world debt is issued in dollars. So how did the dollar become so powerful? It all happened after the Second World War. Until then, all currencies were valued in relation to gold. So gold was the benchmark. Currency values were determined based on this principle. How do they compare with the value of a specified quantity of gold? After the war, the US and its allies came up with an agreement. It was called the Bretton Woods Agreement. Do you know what it did? It replaced gold with the dollar. So all national currencies were valued in relation to the US dollar. That's how the dollar became so important. Which is why we now say that the rupee is trading for such and such amount against the dollar. Its value is determined in comparison to the dollar. And this became the trend after the Second World War. Then came the oil boom. And the oil boom led to a dollar boom. You see, the dollar has become the world's dominant currency. It became the dominant reserve currency by the 1970s. So it only made sense for oil trade to be settled using American dollars. Oil transactions were made using American dollars. This came to be known as the petrodollar system. And investors stick to it because the dollar gives them a sense of stability. And that's purely on a business level. On the government side, though, the thinking is changing. Many countries are realizing the pitfalls of being overly dependent on the US dollar. Take Russia, for instance. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, it held more than 600 billion US dollars in foreign reserves. 600 billion. The US weaponized its dollar supremacy. It froze Russia's holdings. And the U.S. can do this with any country it wants to. This realization, the kind of power that America wields, is making many countries extremely uncomfortable. China, for instance, it's skeptical. Russia, of course, has been burned firsthand, which is why it is pushing BRICS to develop a common currency. BRICS is an acronym for a group of five top emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, BRICS. Together, BRICS have a 24% share in the global economy. They represent 40% of the world's total population. If they do come up with a common currency, a BRICS currency, it could, it could pose a stiff challenge to the US dollar. And the dollar is not the only one. Let's talk about the Euro 2, the official currency of 20 European nations. Together, they form the Eurozone, countries that use the Euro. This region has 344 million people. The euro has one of the highest combined values of banknotes and coins in circulation the world over. Why wouldn't it? Hundreds of millions of people use the euro. The sheer size of the eurozone gives it a mathematical advantage. Then comes Japan's yen, the world's third most traded currency, also the third biggest reserve currency globally. Fourth on the list is the UK's pound sterling. It is the world's oldest currency that is still in use. Next is China's renminbi better known as the yuan. China wants the yuan to be used as a reserve too. It has sealed deals with countries like Russia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Thailand and Japan. What do these agreements do? They allow for trade to be settled directly in the yuan. So China has pushed the US dollar out of the equation. 
at least with these countries. It is trading directly in the yuan. Reports say it is trying to secure a similar deal with Saudi Arabia, which will be a very big deal. China, you see, is an oil guzzler. It buys a lot of its oil from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia makes up for 18% of China's total crude oil purchases. In the first 10 months of last year, 2022, the first 10 months, here's how much China paid Saudi Arabia for oil. More than 55 billion US dollars. Imagine that trade being settled without the dollar. And imagine more countries working out similar arrangements. In fact, that's already happening. Brazil and Argentina plan to announce a common currency. Russia and Iran are working on a cryptocurrency backed by gold. India and the UAE are looking for ways to conduct non-oil trade in rupees. Last December, Sri Lanka agreed to use the Indian rupee for all international trade with India. India and Russia also took a big step. The rupee was used for the first time to settle foreign trade between India and Russia. In fact, India's central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has a whole mechanism in place. It's called the International Settlement of Trade in the Indian Rupee. The goal is quite simple, to facilitate settlement of trade using the rupee. Bangladesh is also considering settling bilateral trade in Indian rupees. The world you see is changing. Countries do not want their fortunes to be held in one currency, at the mercy of one country. The big currencies the world over have had it too good for far too long, their uncontested rally may be coming to an end. Email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India, because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power like a partner and not a former colony. The US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one. The Kohinoor and the Colonial Loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.